Thanks for being here, all of you, for all of our readers and for each of your neighbors that you come back with a better spirit to and share with them. So we will, uh, we'll, we'll just get started with our opening voice tonight. Um, um, a friend of mine for the last 15 years, um, I ran an inn for many years on Block Island called the Hygieia House. And about a year into it, a group of women wrote to me and said they'd love to come on a, a poetry retreat. And I thought, that well, well, that would be good. And then they came, and I, I didn't want to share with them that I maybe was a poet. I don't know what being a poet means, except you're a weirdo kid at four who's writing poems, and then you keep doing it mostly for the rest of your life, but more at 4 and 11 and 12 than at 53. At any rate, um, my, our opening voice tonight is Davine Verstandig. And I, I met her in 1999 at the inn that I ran on Block Island when she first came on retreat with a, a number of women that she was writing with. Um, she's a Yukon fellow. She's been teaching there for 25 years. I don't um, like to announce poets. I like them to speak for themselves. Here's my friend and an amazing woman, Devine Verstandek. In the orchard, only the words of the midnight moon and the thud of falling apples comfort me. This is for Lisa. Brother, the retriever. Untouched, something begins to happen to me. After a while, I hold myself back, stand further apart from others than usual. Even a friend's embrace feels too risky. I try massages, then hunger more for a lover's touch. Here on this island, the innkeeper's dog, brother, senses I need looking after, attaches himself to me night and day, sleeps at the foot of my bed, breakfasts with me, nuzzles me when I read my poems, joins me for a cigarette on the porch, lies beneath my feet at meals. Sometimes he sleeps beside me, his soft head pushing my arm, his heft a comfort. Brother, you have a noble head deeper than brown eyes that see me. I do not know what you sensed when you saw me open the taxi door, but I sank into your familiar, grateful for your presence. For all who are suffering addiction, over. It's finally over for the one craving the high, for the other craving help for the one wanting the high, over for the one dying for the fix, over for the endless day and nights wondering and praying and crying, over for the one promising to call home and not doing it, over for the one waiting by the phone. Where is she? What city, what town, what gutter? Over the lies told to hide the truth, over for the believer trying to believe the, uh, the lies. 
peace, I hope, for the one in the ground, for the mother who told me, I'm grieving, I'm angry, I'm relieved too. Peace. There is language everywhere. Maybe not letters or words, but for me, this morning's violet growing by my doorstep is language. The buds of the lilac tree beside the door, the shoots of what will turn into bleeding hearts, the forsythia as it scribbles the front of the house, Winter's language, where fox, deer, raccoon, and bird footprints, even bare branches tell a story. Snow is a glorious, silent language, and rain's language and winds, sometimes gentle and sometimes wild, the breathing of sleeping lover or infant, language. Fingers are language, speaking of tenderness and fists of fury. Do not get caught up in the alphabet. It is simply knots on a string. Just listen and look. Breaths, a sandpiper's tracks, the roll of rocks under pulling waves, clouds, sometimes quiet as a dream, other times gray, tumultuous like anger. Hush, so many things are speaking. This is a poem written for a friend of mine who uh, died this summer. For Linnea. How close death feels as I watch you sleeping. Is it sleep or a morphine-induced state? Fever, bald, hospital bed, Mouth open, watching your chest rise and fall, watching your twin sister, watching you breathe. She presses the morphine pump. Hospice says 24 hours or so. Gaunt and exhausted, you told me days ago you wanted to go quickly. Sister agreed. So valiant, she sleeps beside you on the couch. I place my hands on you, speaking through my fingers. You are loved. I tell sister what I am saying, then four hands on you, your chest rising and falling. I repeat, you are loved. Sister leaves to do the laundry. I remain. One hand over your heart. One hand on your head. Softly, I repeat. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You die at 3.33. The morning after, I watched the sky darken, then the midnight depth of sadness covered the roof. Birds slept, forest animals settled in their lairs. The morning after, I sat with half-drunk coffee, looking down the road where your 
Cars' red taillights had glowed like the tip of a cigarette moving through darkness. The morning after you left, I remembered everything you said and everything I didn't say, too scared or shocked. That morning, I became someone I didn't want to be. After last night's fierce, frenzied sex, an ending of sorts, I didn't recognize the person I'd become, full of need and terror. The morning after that night, when lust fevered with unspoken words, emptiness filled the room, I got in my car, left our house by the shore, turning towards the city. I drove to a place whirling with distractions and found a space, not to hide, but finally in time to emerge. Every woman should carry. Every woman should carry a box of matches, a knife, a handkerchief, a pencil, pens run out of ink. Forgiveness, a thousand pounds of courage and space for loving. A woman should carry a warm shawl, enough grace, and a small bottle of fine cognac. A heart not broken in too many places, and the ability to forget, and enough endurance. This is called Ideas Without Words Are. I leave words out. Is it because I don't need them, or are they beyond my mind's grasp? Really, it is because I have forgotten them. Words are often clouds without centers. One needs meaning to find a word. Have I forgotten the word, but meaning remains in the shade? Once my word was an arrow, precise as it hit its target, a bull's eye even. Now the bow is heavy and hard to load the arrow. Where or what is the target? What is a poet who is losing words, who stumbles about in the dark of no words, not exact words, wrong words? Sometimes hours pass, even days, and then I remember the lost word, that lost word, left alone in the past, frightened, forgotten. I try to find le mot juste, the right word, but it is, I am losing my grip, my vocabulary. Yesterday, I could not find the word. A member at the university, I asked, could my student take an exam? I need someone to Yes, if you fill out this form, we can provide a proctor. The island of lost words is becoming more real. Not so far away from my shore, all the words I've lost are populating the island. All those lost words are not making sentences or poems but prisoners waiting for extinction. 
A poet makes things. I am a poet. Maybe being is what I want more of. Days empty of making. Days full of being. Words rise from the steam of the kettle. In barely a second, I glimpse meaning, all wisps and moisture, translucent words, meaning nothing more than steam and smoke. Recognition, the noticing, steam rising, appearing and disappearing, coming and going. It may never come again, my seeing words in steam, then gone, appearing and disappearing, and all the waiting in between. What is this silence that is not peaceful? Not my reassuring safe harbor where reflection guides my thoughts to words. This one is not a place of quiet comfort. What or who is this that hides my words, teasing me with empty spaces where words once rippled from my tongue? Who or what hides the names of people I have known for decades, face to face, speak with them, harboring this humiliation of losing their names? I hope prayer doesn't need words, only intention. Will that be lost to me? Will that knowing sky I speak to understand without my words? This new silence, this new emptiness, is not the one of Zen. This silence frightens me, often opening emptiness greater and longer than mere pauses. I take up my pen to write about this fearful silence, this different emptiness. I strain writing losing, of losing words coming closer to that frightening and growing more familiar island of lost words. On the way to work. Earlier this morning, I saw a woman, ponytailed and blonde, sitting beside a newly dug grave waiting for grass, head bowed, hands cupping her face, seeming to watch the grave, waiting for something to change. Walking to work in Hartford today, as with most mornings, I see a homeless woman carefully folding the card bed cardboard she slept on, hiding it among the bushes, hoping no one will find it. Autumn Sweet One. What is a life but tears and dust, ash and bone, blood and breath? You have been gone a long distance, I cannot reach. Your absence as knife-like, as deep night, it no longer matters. Gone is gone. Autumn is trying to return, hot days crowding her, leaves turning. We are all dying into a frozen white winter changing as leaves do their colors, wrinkles succumb into once firm skin, eyesight and hearing dimming. We forget 
repeating what we remember over and over, forgetting what we repeated, remembering embarrassed, clumsiness covering our blank spots. We stumble and crumbling a bit inside like autumn changing, move towards a quiet death. What do I look for in a book? A way in, burrowing through words I find an armchair of story, pipe smoke of philosophy, licorice stick of sex. Sauntering through story, finding a resting place where comfort lodges, there I settle in, remarkably myself. What is it about a starry night makes one small, moves one closer to a belief in the one with a thousand names or none? What is it about wave after wave, ocean stretching, if not to infinity, to a horizon line? Is belief deeper than faith? Is it faith without dogma and doctrine? Beliefs get shaken, throttled, bruised, beaten up. Yet something of belief survives and endures, grasps this heart, nearly wrung out, smoothed its ragged spiked edges, that starry night, that endless ocean, their relentless clarity certains me. A room of forgetfulness. In a shell of silence, I wait for night. There, something like comfort. I fix my dinner, a piece of chicken, two ears of corn, a glass of water. I feed the cat. I wash one pan, one pot, one dish, one glass, one knife, one fork. I make a cup of tea and withdraw into the dark. I remember listening to Miles, kind of blue, darker than twilight blue, and Chet Baker's Let's Get Lost, an open wound, and Julie London's Cry Me a River. I heard music then, more than notes and words. I heard the times, the apartments with record players, Heard songs in the hands I held, heard them in the lips I kissed, listening to Roberta Flax the first time ever. I remember making love at a New York fire escape on a hot August night on St. Mark's Place, listening to Francois Hardy's Comment to dire adieu, it hurts to say goodbye, Days later, making love to James Taylor's You've Got a Friend and hearing Chicago Transit Authority, does anyone know what time it is on mescaline? <laughs> Sweet love, hurting love, despairing love, lust, sex without love, goodbye sex, and emptying love. I no longer listen to music. Hearing aids distort everything. No more love songs. Lovers gone, only empty hands, and my own 4 a.m. blues. And the last poem is called Vision and Reunion. Beneath the smoke is fire. Beneath the mist is waterland, the gratifying mystery of things not understood. This 
place of being is but one. There is a translucent veil between this world and another, parting from time to time for those who know it, a glint of other and all, where reason stumbles silent. Here I am more than being and less temporary. Here only stars reason. Waves have tongues and speak. I glimpse what yellowing to green means. I intuit more than knowing. A white sky holds what blue words do, their language loss and longing. The invisible breathes into me lemon and lavender and twilight and dawning. Phantom and temporal, this skin between me and thee, now and then, before and after, Stillness and incessancy, rising and falling, blessings, this other side, this moment through. Thank you.
Silence, a room. I can't get to you. 
I can't imagine what it would have been like to follow Melanie Greenhouse into the host position. Um, I've spent many months thinking about how to step into Christie's shoes. And we do things differently, but we also do things collectively. And um, Christy, uh, what I'm going to say is that I'm not going to give you a huge list of Wally Lamb's accomplishments, of the awards that he's won, of the millions of books that he sold that have been translated into how many languages, the way his voice that comes basically from everywhere else in Norwich, Connecticut, has managed to message itself around the world. So the accolades are in a small version in your programs, in a larger version on our website, and in an even larger you know, volume on Wally's website. It's wallylam.net. I've spent the last um, month just um, I'm a Norwich girl. I was born in Norwich, as my brother and sister were, and both of my parents, and most of, not most, two of my grandparents. Um, Norwich is where we came from, and Norwich is where my parents met, and Norwich is what they sort of grieved and loved and thrived on forever. I remember being about 13 years old, driving home from Sunday school. We had to go to Sunday school in Waterford because we were Jewish. We were Silverbergs, and there, and there wasn't a Hebrew school in Norwich. So we, we went to um, whatever that public school is on Lathrop Road in Waterford, Connecticut. And I remember David saying, like, look, Waterford's blossoming. Like, Norwich is the town that time forgot. And it seemed like the smartest thing I'd ever heard. He was about 12 and I was 10. And he was sort of right. You know, Norwich just sort of held fast in time. And it still does, for better or worse. And it heaves. And it grows. And it steps back. But Norwich was a place that time forgot until Wally Lamb began remembering it for all of us. And turning those things that we take for granted into dalliance and fiction and extraordinaire, even though it's the real people. So, Wally, when I read We Are Water and Sally Ogilnick appeared, I mean, Harry Ogilnick was my dad's great friend, and Sally was the wild sister that we only got to see once in a while if we went on just enough errands with our father, and we ended up in Harry Ogilnick's shop, and Sally would be working. She had that hair. So, um, at any rate, I don't want to speak about Wally's accolades. What I, what, I, what I do want to do is just take you down. He's been here forever, sort of, a fixture in our lives. Wally, I think you are at work on your seventh novel. Is, did I miss one? No, I think that's right. Okay. So what I thought I would do, because I've, I've spent some time, I thought I would just, because we have a huge amount of books out there on that table, with huge support from Bank Square Books. And last time, at any rate, if there's any Wally Lamb book that you did not read, or five, or four, or three of them, it's time to read them all. And so I'm going to read you an excerpt from each of them, and then Wally's going to come right up. We'll start with She's Come Undone, which was published in 1992 when you were still, I think, teaching English at Norwich Free Academy. So imagine teaching all these high school kids and managing to get a novel written, written that became not only on the New York Times bestseller list, but number one. I'll just get to the work. These are just excerpts. She's Come Undone, 1992. So um, Dolores Price, that gal, is 21 at the time, remembering when she was 13, because that's where she is at with her doctor. And the reason I chose this passage should be pretty self-evident. This was the summer, 1993, 
Watergate, Watergate preempted all of the afternoon soaps and then became a soap itself. At first, I was indignant about not getting my daily fix of love is a many splendid thing and search for tomorrow, but gradually I got sucked into the pull of those Senate hearings, the play of good guys against bad guys, truth against lies. My favorites were grandfatherly Sam Irwin and Moe Dean, John's wife, whose platinum-tinted bun reminded me of Genevieve Sweets. Geneva Suites. My sessions with Dr. Shaw that summer were not going well. He kept wanting to talk about sex, and I kept wanting to talk about Watergate. That's Dolores at 21, remembering what it was like to be 13. Then there's a six-year gap, and while he publishes, I know this much is true. There's a tiny passage from I Know This Much Is True on the back of your programs. Here's a beefier of one. When you're the brother of a schizophrenic identical twin, the tricky thing about saving yourself is the blood it takes on your hands. The little inconvenience of the look-alike corpse at your feet. And if you're into both survival of the fittest and be being your brother's keeper, if you've promised your dying mother, then say so long to sleep and hello to the middle of the night. Get a book, grab a book or a beer. Get used to Labor Letterman's gap tooth smile or the view of the bedroom ceiling, or the indifference of random selection. Take it from a godless insomniac, take it from the uncrazy twin, the guy who beat the biochemical rap. Then, how many years later, 10 years later, Wally wrote The Hour I First Believed. Here's the opening sentence to that astonishing book. You know that one? Chaos Theory and Columbine and Displaced. Okay. They were both working their final shift at Blackjack Pizza that night, although nobody but the two of them realized it was that. Give them this much. They were talented secret keepers patient planners. They'd been planning it for a year, hiding their intentions in plain sight on paper, on videotape, over the internet. I don't think I'll go on from here, Wally. I pulled great quotes from your next three novels, but I think the audience is eager to hear you. So come on up here, Wally, and do what you do best. Hey everybody, it's really good to be back. I've, uh, I've always enjoyed the audiences uh, when I've come here, and I think, I think I've come here about four times now, right, Melanie? Yeah. Yes, yes, so this is number four. Got it. Um, I, I feel very grateful to uh, Melanie and to Christy and Lisa, um, who in Norwich we would call not Lisa Starr, but Lisa Starr, right? Yeah. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to start with a, a funny piece, um, which is autobiographical. So I'm writing toward number 33 of my 37 stop book tour. My driver, Irfan, drops me off in front of the store. It's the grand opening of this suburban Illinois Costco on the Monday before Thanksgiving. Because of traffic, I'm 10 minutes late and full of apologies, but none of the front door greeters knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Book signing, a manager says, nah, I don't think we do those, but maybe if you write to the company. 
Several people with clipboards approach. Each tries to sign me up for a Costco membership. <laughs> Declining, I ask for directions to the men's room and the book department. I have my priorities, and at my age, peeing is number one. <laughs> All of the employees know where the bathrooms are located. Nobody knows where they keep the books. <laughs> but the restrooms are sparkling clean, brand new. I flush, I wash, I exit, and then I wander a store that is the approximate size of Delaware. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, I find the books. We Are Water is stacked in piles roughly the same cubic footage as one of those pre-assembled backyard sheds that they sell. <laughs> Next to my book is Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus. And if my cubic footage is a shed, Bill's is a three-car garage. There's a table with Sharpie pens on it, a poster of me on an easel, and a chair. I sit on the chair, and it's so low I can rest my nostrils on the tabletop. <laughs> and so I grab eight copies of Killing Jesus, stack them on the seat, and sit back down. Much better. People stream by, confused or wary as they stare at me. Have I sprouted a horn or a melon-sized goiter or something? Has a ferret climbed on, on my head? Well, think positive, I tell myself. You ran out of toothpaste two stops ago. You can use the GPS on your phone, find the health and beauty department, and buy some toothpaste before you leave. A young manager stops by, and he asks me if he can get me anything. Yeah, how about some book enthusiasts, I think. <laughs> but what I say is, some water, please? He says he'll be right back with the water. Ooh, sorry, O'Reilly. I had a bean burrito for lunch. <laughs> I said... When I was writing this, I said to my wife, I read that part, and she goes, you're not going to write that, say that in public, are you? I go, hell yeah, especially when I get to Mystic. <laughs> Twenty minutes in, my first customer approaches the table. She's a little girl of about six. How much are these, she asks. She's pointing to the Sharpies. <laughs> I kid you not. When I... When I tell her they're not for sale, she blinks back tears, and I relent. Well, here you go, sweetheart. This one's for you. From a nearby fleeceware aisle, her mother yells, Keisha, what did I tell you about taking things from strange men? <laughs> then a couple stops. They look Middle Eastern. The wife is wearing a headscarf. The husband asks me what my book is about. Well, it's partly about a wife who leaves her husband for a woman, I say. The husband grabs his wife by the arm and rushes her away. I chase after them, calling, uh, and, a, and a flood. It's about a flood, too. They round the snow tire aisle, never to be seen again. And then two women arrive who have actually driven to the store to meet me and get their books signed. Wow, we thought there'd be a line, one of them says. Nope, no line. I shrug, I sign. I pose for their pictures. We chat. They say they're looking forward to reading the novel. I glance at my watch. I have about two more hours to go. Well, would you like me to read you the first chapter? <laughs> or maybe the first five or six? One of the women seems vaguely interested. The other says, well, she has to go home and start thawing out her Thanksgiving turkey. A husband and wife have an argument right in front of the table. Here's the dialogue. Wife, can you just wait for two seconds? I want to finish reading his book jacket. Husband, yeah, and I want the free meatballs they're giving away at that card up there. <laughs> and if they run out before they get, we get there, you're going to go home and make me some meatballs. <laughs> A nerdy-looking boy with glasses and a faux hawk, age 11 or 12, asks me if I wrote all those books. He's pointing to the hundreds of copies of my novel. Every single one of them, I say. <laughs> he tells me he hates reading. 
I tell him his haircut looks kind of stupid. <laughs> and that they're giving away free meatballs two aisles down. He says he hates meatballs. Oh, and free Game Boys at the far end of the store. They're almost out. Go. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're like my favorite author of all time. A heavily pierced young woman says, Really? Is she mistaking me for, I don't know, Johnny Rotten or one of the Ramones or something? Has one of them written an autobiography? But no, she means me. However, this exchange has nothing to do with the book purchase, but I do honor her request, grab my Sharpie, and sign her stomach. <laughs> for the last 25 minutes of my assigned time, I, I converse with a guy who says he's a police detective who always wanted to be a writer. You're living my dream, he says. I want to tell him that I had to eat M&Ms out of the hotel vending machine for dinner the night before, and that he is living my dream to be able to leave this damn store, go home, and thaw out my Thanksgiving turkey. Well, I never get the water. I find the toothpaste aisle, but I don't really think that I need a 36-pack. Exiting, I am asked by half a dozen more people if I want to sign up for a Costco membership. I politely decline. Outside, it's snowing and freezing cold. I've forgotten my scarf inside, but I'm afraid I'll never be able to find the book section again. Irfan <laughs> drives up and I get in the car, noting that he has been passing the time by reading Killing Jesus. <laughs> well, how was it, he asks. Oh, great, I say. They were giving away meatballs and Sharpies. Here, have one. It's on me. <laughs> so now that I've uh, now that I've disabused you all of uh, any thoughts you might have had about this being a glamorous life for an uh, for a, an author on tour, um, I would like to say um, how. Uh, how really pleased and fortunate I am to be um, on the same program uh, with uh, uh, Davine, yeah, close enough, and uh, with Swimming Bell as well. Um, and of course, now we've gotten to the low rent portion of the program. Um, I'm. Uh, I also wanted to say about about poets and poetry that I think they are. They are the real magicians of language. You know, I'm just sort of a, you know, yeoman prose guy. Um, but I have great respect for poets. Um, one of my favorite poets is Elizabeth Thomas, sitting over there. Uh, not only as a poet, but also as a teacher. Um, one of my kids, uh, Justin, my son Justin, uh, had the very good fortune of being in a poetry group that... Uh, uh, that she was working with. He was in high school at the time. And, um, and <clears throat> he graduated from Boston University and uh, is now uh, living and teaching in New Orleans. But he's also become a, a slam poet, uh, a spoken word poet. And he was, he was a member of the New Orleans team uh, maybe four or five years back when they, when they won the national championship. And, uh, and that, that comes from the from the fertile ground that Elizabeth uh, raised those kids in. Um, so um, when I looked at the <laughs> when I looked at the website uh, uh, for this program tonight, um, I was sort of amazed uh, to find that I was listed as the poet, and um, and I it it, it 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 launched some PTSD stuff for me uh, because uh, my only. Uh, my only shot at poetry was back in seventh grade. I was just talking about this story earlier tonight. Um, uh, we, I, we had a sort of a wild and crazy teacher. Her name was Mrs. Kramer. And um, we were, <laughs> do you remember Mrs. Kramer? Yeah, yeah, Dorothy Kramer. And um, so she signed us up to perform, now, and this is my seventh grade English class. Uh, she signed us up to um, 
uh, to perform for a school-wide assembly. And she chose for our, uh, for our performance a poem, a choral poem, I think it, it was. Uh, it was Vacha Lindsay's The Potatoes Dance. Um, and it was this sort of trippy poem about potatoes in the cellar and they come alive and, you know. And anyway, so I was chosen for, uh, I was chosen for a lead. I was, a, I was the solo person and also the person who introduced the poem. And so she would say, here's the way you say it, Walter. The potatoes dance. And I, I, the potatoes dance. No, no. The potatoes dance. The potatoes dance. And um, I never did get it right. I think I, I introduced it as the potatoes dance. But my solo, which I remember, it's sort of burned in my brain like a, I don't know, something horrible. Um, but it, uh, my solo was, that it's, you have to picture all the seventh graders in back of me. And they were doing the choral part. And um, again, this is about potatoes. And, uh, and, and, I, and I was the lead potato, and I, I come up to the microphone. Now, you have, to, you have to picture that this is Kelly Junior High School, 1960, I don't know, two or three. And the school is brand new, and um, you, know, this, you know, really shiny floors on the gym, and there's a stage at one end of the gym, and we were up on the stage. And this was my solo. There was just, oh, and, and I, was, I was chubby. I was kind of a fat kid. And, uh, and my solo went like this. There was just one sweet potato. He was golden brown and slim. The ladies loved his dancing. And then I have to go like this. And, they, and, and, the, and the, class behind, the class in back of me goes, the ladies loved his dancing. And I go... The ladies loved his dancing. They danced all night with him. <laughs> now, at this point, I, I, had, a, I had a shot of the, the far end of the gym, and um, I had been watching the science teachers who were all leaning against the wall, like bored out of their minds. And all of a sudden, after, this, after my big solo, they were doubled over laughing. <laughs> Which is why I felt a little PTSD when I was listed as the poet. Uh, so this is, this is the first chapter of my new novel. And I'm not too much further along uh, than this. Um, but I think I'm going to call this The Water is Wide. That may change. On the chow, let's go. The officer at the control desk flips a switch, and our cell doors pop open simultaneously. My cellmate in the bed above mine doesn't stir. It's 5.15, and Moskowitz thinks getting up before 10 is uncivilized. He's more of a brunch guy, which works for him because we line up for, the mid for midday chow at 10.30. I listen to the footfalls out on the tier and the usual banter and bickering of the troops lining up for breakfast. Ordinarily, I would be out there in the middle of the pack saying little or nothing, but that was C.O. Plemons' voice calling us to chow. I'd rather listen to my stomach growl than have to face that fuckwad before sun's up. Not that skipping the morning meal is much of a sacrifice. The state of Connecticut likes to feed us on the cheap, and there is nothing more cost-effective than processed carbs. Watery oatmeal, breakfast cake, imitation orange drink, and some days an overripe banana. They meet the dietary regulations by putting protein pellets in the oatmeal. And though they don't count the occasional mealworm floating around in there, or the fruit flies feasting on the banana, there is another couple of protein sources for us too. So, yum. Speed it up, ladies. This is one of Clemens's lesser put-downs. In the 34 months I've been here, I've heard him call us turds, scum, vermin. One evening when something set him off, he shouted up and down the tier that the next time we talked to our mothers, we should tell them all that we should have been abortions. 
It's pretty much a universal opinion around here that Officer Tyler Plemons is an immature a-hole who imagines that the badge ironed to his uniform makes him a law, to, law and order badass. He arrived at Yates after his uncle, Deputy Warden Jerry Zabrowski, got him transferred here from the women's prison, the better to keep an eye on him. According to the jailhouse scuttlebutt, which by my calculation is usually about 90% reliable, Officer Plemons, a newlywed not long out of the training academy, had been indulging in a little third shift hanky-panky with one of the women in his custody. She was a pedigreed grifter who was shrewder than her paramour. In exchange for staying silent about the fact that her jailer had knocked her up, she negotiated a get out of jail free card. I guess you would call it a win-win-win situation. She got her freedom and her uterus vacuumed out her boyfriend got to save his marriage, and corrections got to dodge a front page scandal. The only losers in this whole thing were the men of Yates Correctional, who now had to put up with Plemons. A few nights ago, I dreamt I saw him on the outside at a store or something, and I came up behind him, tapped him on the shoulder, and when he turned around, I cold cocked him, watched him fall flat on his back, his arms and legs flailing like an overturned beetle. I woke up smiling. Plemons and I have a history. Do I sound cynical? Well, guilty as charged. When you're incarcerated, you learn quickly enough that cynicism is one of the survival techniques that prevents you from being sucked into the black hole of despair. The last thing you want to do at a place where it's wise not to trust anyone is make yourself vulnerable. Hand somebody some information they might later use as a weapon against you. So it's better to assume the people around here will sell you out if it's in their best interest than to find out the hard way. Cynicism, it's like a suit of armor. Don't talk about your crime. That's another way that you can survive in here. Try as best you can not to think too much about what you did. Focus on the pain and the absurdity of the day-to-day -day so that you can dodge the pain and guilt you're carrying about the past. Thinking about your future, well, that's safe too, up to a point. Planning how to pick up again where you left off before they made you come here. Try to convince yourself that everyone else's life has hit pause because yours has. Ignore the fact that the number of visits and letters you used to get has dropped off. Tell yourself that Nobody you love has moved on, that they're all just waiting for you to get out. Outsmarting the not-so-smart COs is a third way to hold on to your sanity. Prison life is so boringly restrictive, and the majority of the guards they hire to keep us in line are so devoid of imagination that it almost invites guys to become MacGyvers. And trust me, some of my fellow felons are brilliant improvisers. This dude, D'Angelo, who's on my tier, he jerry-rigged his beard trimmer, turned it into a tattoo gun, and went into business for himself. So now his lockbox is jam-packed with other guys' commissary that they trade for tats. My first cellmate, Tofi, he had a frickin' still going on in his toilet tank. He would put sugar, water, and fruit rinds in a plastic bag. Booze needs yeast, too, and you can't get yeast from the commissary, but you can stick bread down the front of your pants at chow and get cheesecloth from one of your buddies in the culinary arts program. Wrap up the bread, throw it in the bag with the other stuff, let the yeast separate out, and wait 10 days or so when, while everything in the tank ferments. Then, voila, homemade hooch. I did not partake when Tofi offered me some. It smelled too nasty. But he got so hammered that he needed the next day to sleep it off, and they had to cancel the AA meeting that he was supposed to chair. <laughs> the black hole of despair, its official name is clinical depression with suicidal ideation. The psych services here are hit or miss, and inmate suicides are common enough so that the toilet tanks, uh, toilet sinks rather, in our cells are 
ligature resistant. That means their rounded edges make it harder for somebody to knot one end of a sheet around the plumbing, knot the other end around his neck, and yank himself to death. A few months after I came here, this guy on our tier, Edwin, found a way to do just that, and he almost succeeded. White guy in his 30s, bipolar. He should have been in a psych facility instead of a prison. Three Rivers State Hospital was not necessarily the answer for all the patients who were institutionalized there before they closed it, but making prison the dumping ground for the mentally ill is just going to make them sicker. Not long after Edwin was admitted, word got around that, he gave, that they gave him two years for exposing his junk and masturbating outside a middle school during one of his manic episodes. I don't know if it was because they doped him up after he got here or because he was just antisocial, but he hardly ever said anything to anyone, including his bunkie, who nicknamed him Casper the Unfriendly Ghost. It became a joke around here, a way to harass him, try to get a rise out of him. Hey, Edwin, when's the zombie apocalypse? Or, my man, Edwin, hey, next time just send them little girls a dick pic. I never joined in, but I never tried to stop it either. You take the high road around here and you can become the next target. The only contact with Edwin was that I had was when we would both show up in the TV room during rec time to watch Jeopardy. I'm an avid reader and something of a Jeopardy snob, so it pissed me off a little that Edwin knew more of the answers than I did. Mostly, we would both just talk to Alex Trebek. Who is Pearl Buck? Where was Constantinople? What is Vermouth? But one time, Edwin and I had an actual conversation. The final Jeopardy category was presidential R&R. Trebek said, this 20th century commander-in-chief summered on an island located in Canada's Bay of Fundy. Who is Coolidge, I said. And simultaneously, Edwin said, FDR. As we watched the TV contestants write down their answers and make their wagers, Edwin started doing that thing that kind of drove me nuts, tapping his long, yellowy Edward Scissorhands fingernails <laughs> and humming along to that final Jeopardy music that they always play. Da 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 To get him to stop, I asked him if he had heard that they were planning a facility shakedown the following week. He shook his head. No eye contact. No thanks for the heads up. But he did stop humming and tapping, so I had accomplished my objective. The Jeopardy champion guessed wrong. But the guy on the right and the homeschooling mom in the middle both had the correct answer, J FDR. Having wagered all of her money, the mom became the new champ. Unexpectedly, Edwin turned and faced me. I was there once, he said. What? Campobello Island. That's where the Roosevelt summer home was. My mother and I went camping there. You could take a tour, and we took it. And it was interesting. Yeah, I said, cool. Wheel of Fortune was coming on next, and I hate that stupid show. So I got up to leave. <clears throat> by the way, <clears throat> by the way, he said, I'm Edwin Liggett. What's your name? Corby Ledbetter, I said. Oh, how long are you in here for? I was taken aback. Word always gets around eventually about what kind of sentence this one or that one got slapped with but no one asked this directly to the person they're curious about. Still, how is this Edwin Leggett going to know if he never talked to anybody? And besides, he was harmless enough, I figured. Three years, I said. Oh, I'm in here for two. Are you? Yeah, if I last that long. He didn't seem like the dig a tunnel to the outside with a spoon type. So I figured he was either looking for sympathy from someone whose sentence was a year longer than his, or else he was hinting about suicide. Well, if he was thinking about doing himself in, let him talk to a counselor. I wasn't anybody's shrink, and I didn't want to be. I had enough problems of my own. Rec time was just about over anyway, so I started to walk out. 
And that was when he hit me with the second question that you're not supposed to ask. What did you do? I stopped. Excuse me? What did you do? Why are you in here? I answered him like I was on Jeopardy. What is none of your business? I walked out shaking my head. I was on the walkway the morning I heard them call a code purple. Saw them rush Edwin past on a gurney. His head was the color of an eggplant, and I heard again what he had said that time, if I last that long. Jesus Christ, what would it have cost me to let somebody know what he had told me? Lieutenant Swan, maybe, or C.O. Cavanero, one of the ones who showed you a little compassion. I assumed Edwin was dead, but he wasn't. Word got around that they brought him to the psych unit, stripped him naked, stuck him in the, su in the suicide watch cell. They keep the lights on 24-7 there, and they park a guard outside for observation in case the patient tries to off himself some other way. This is standard procedure. When there is an attempted hang-up, which shows you how clueless they are around here, I saw this show on National Geographic once, and about how in Alaska, all that midnight sun screws with people's circadian rhythms, and how relentless daylight really fucks up people who have bipolar. So what does DOC do to make sure the patient doesn't harm himself anymore? They stick him in a six by eight foot cell where the lights never go off, drive him a little further over the edge. The thing is, they don't even do this to be vindictive, to torture somebody like it's Abu Ghraib or something. It's just their typical combination of ignorance, indifference, and cover your ass. Boy, they hate it when inmate suicides make the papers. Edwin came off suicide watch, and they released him from the psych unit maybe eh, 10 days or so after his attempt. The only time I saw him was the night he wandered into the rec room during Jeopardy. You could tell from the dazed look on his face that he was heavily sedated. This time, instead of calling out the answers, he just kept staring at nothing. When I asked him how he was doing, he didn't answer, didn't even look at me. A month or so later, he made a second attempt to check out. I guess you could say he was and wasn't successful this time. From what I heard, he's just this side of brain dead now, sits parked in a wheelchair all day in the forensic wing of some convalescent home on the other side of the state. So why am I focusing on all the fun comings and goings at the Yates Motel instead of getting down to the business of what Edwin wanted to know, why I'm here? <clears throat> why they handed me a three-year sentence for what I did? Because that's another of those survival tools that, keeps, that helps you dodge the black hole that sucked Edwin in. Don't talk about what you did. Try as best you can not to even think about it. Focus on the pain and the absurdity of the day-to-day -day so that you can dodge the pain and guilt that you're carrying about the past. Thinking about your future, that's safe too up to a point. Planning how to pick up again where you left off when they made you come here. But okay, Edwin, you want to know what I did? Fair enough. I'm the dad. <clears throat> who on the morning of April the 3rd, 2017, took a 6 a.m. Xanax, chased it with a couple of splashes of Captain Morgan in my coffee, and then waved my wife off to work at the school where she reaches, where she teaches instead of kissing her so that she wouldn't get a whiff of booze breath. I told her to have fun on the field trip to Peabody Museum she was taking with her fifth graders, and I promised I would handle dinner. Back then, I was a Mr. Mom and theoretically a job hunter, although truth be told, I had pretty much given up the hunt by then. Ten months earlier, I had gotten laid off from the commercial art department of the advertising firm where I worked. Rhonda, my manager, had waited until the end of the day to tell me. In fairness, 
She had not realized she was letting the axe fall on Maisie and Nico's first birthday. The year before, it was Rhonda who had arranged for the lunchtime celebration of my twins' birth. Cake, gift cards, packs of huggies, jokes about sleeplessness. It's not about the quality of your work, Corby, Rhonda assured me. It's about the company's bottom line. It was a very difficult decision, but I was told that I couldn't keep you both. And of course, she was not about to lay off Brienne, the golden child, who had been hired after me, but had been getting assigned the bigger accounts. Like me, Brienne had been a scholarship student at the Rhode Island School of Design, but unlike me, she had actually graduated from RISD. I had withdrawn the summer before my junior and senior year, between my junior and senior year, and driven across country to propose to Lily, a grand gesture aimed at changing her mind about us breaking up. And it had worked too. She finished up her degree at UCLA, and I tended bar and sold suits at a men's warehouse in Santa Monica. Not wanting to go home and give Lily the news that in another two weeks, I would be unemployed. I stopped off at bids for a few, and then had a few more, and then split a picture with a couple of the guys from my old softball team who had walked in. How, you do How are things going, Ledbetter? Great, how about you? Later, when I walked into our house half in the bag, I was momentarily confused. Had my boss called my wife with the news that I'd been given my notice? And why in the world had Lily thought balloons were appropriate? Where have you been, she asked. And where's the cake? Oh, God, don't tell me you forgot to pick up the cake. Behind me, I heard car doors slamming. And when I looked around, there were Lily's parents, Betsy's arms full of presents, Bob carrying a rocking horse. My mom had phoned in her regrets. It was her Zumba night. But she had promised she'd catch up with us over the weekend. <clears throat> on that April morning, 10 months later, after my unemployment benefit had run out and we had refinanced our mortgage and done three sessions of marriage counseling to solve our intimacy issue, I felt only pleasantly buzzed, just enough rum and benzo to take the edge off. I lied to Lily, told her that after I dropped off the kids at her mom's, I would send out another round of resumes make a few follow-up calls, and then drive over to Manchester because Hobby Lobby had advertised an opening in their framing department. In truth, having been defeated by several months worth of humiliation in my unsuccessful search for employment, and now dreading the possibility that I might actually get the Hobby Lobby job and have to mat and frame people's shitty mass-produced poster art, <clears throat> not to mention having to work for a company whose politics creeped me out, I would not be driving to Manchester or doing anything else on my false agenda. I would be heading to the liquor store for another pint of the captain and then back home to consume it while watching some daytime TV. CNN, The People's Court, The View. And if I could find it again, that channel that ran reruns of Saved by the Bell. Once the rum and self-pity really kicked in, I might watch some porn, jerk off. That counselor had not been able to reboot our sex life. Maybe I'd take a nap. I'd pick up Maisie and Nico at Betsy's sometime after four, start cooking supper by the time Lily got home, or more and more by then, pick up Chinese or Chipotle for dinner, plus McNuggets for the twins. There was starting to be an embarrassing number of Happy Meal toys on the windowsill in the playroom. That was my plan that day, but none of it happened. Okay, Edwin, here's the hard part. Here's the part I try to avoid thinking about, much less relive the details. There's a name for it, back over. 
Happens more than you would think on average, about 50 kids a week, they say. 48 of them survive, two of them don't. The age of the victim is most often between one year and two years, and the person most often responsible is the victim's parent. Usually the grief that comes from losing a child, coupled with the horror of being the parent who caused the death, is punishment enough. The police who investigate deem it accidental, and they decline to press charges. But in my case, that didn't happen. And it shouldn't have. Under the influence of that pleasant buzz I was enjoying, I put the bag I had packed for the twins' day at their grandmother's on the bottom porch step, and then I went back inside. It was a chilly morning, I remember, so I put the kids' spring jackets on. I locked the front door, and I walked both kids out to the driveway. The usual order of buckling the twins into their car seats is Nico first, because he was the more antsy of the two, and then his more cooperative sister. But the order got turned around that morning for no particular reason. I buckled Maisie into the car seat, and then I remembered the bag on the porch step and hustled back to get it. I placed the bag on the passenger seat up front, waved to our across-the-street across neighbors, Henry and Barbara, as they drove by and tooted, and then, assuming that I had already gotten both kids buckled in, I climbed into our CRV, started it up, and put it in reverse. The average life expectancy of the American male is 76.8 years. That means, actuarially speaking, that my actions that morning deprived my son, Nico, of 74 years and two months of living. The prosecutor cited that statistic as part of her argument that given the results of the tox screen the police had taken that morning after they caught a whiff of my breath and noted that my pupils were dilated, she could not in good conscience deny little Nico Ledbetter the justice he deserved. Your Honor, she said, I realize that Mr. Ledbetter must, for the rest of his own life, reckon with the heartache of having been responsible for the death of his child. <clears throat> but it is a death that would most assuredly not have happened had he not, while his precious two-year-old children were in his care, made the irresponsible decision to operate his vehicle while he was under the influence of benzodiazepine and blood alcohol level of 0.09. I believe that he must be held accountable for that reckless decision because this is his second DUI conviction and because he is the author of a tragedy which has created a ripple effect of profound grief, not only for himself but also for his son's mother, the boy's maternal and paternal grandparents, and the Ledbetter's friends and family. That is not to say whatever grief awaits his daughter when she's old enough to understand. On the verge of tears, I looked back at Lily. She was collapsed against her mother's shoulder, her palms covering her face. Betsy returned my gaze, stone-faced. She had made it known in a letter to the court that she and her husband, Bob, felt that I needed to be punished. My mother and stepmother, their arms around each other, were two rows behind them. Both looked grief-stricken. My father, as usual, was a no-show. The prosecutor repeated the charge against me, second degree involuntary manslaughter due to driving under the influence. She asked the judge for five years. Instead, he gave me three, after which I was handcuffed and taken away. I was 36 years old when I did what I did, 37 by the time I went to prison. Actuarily speaking, that gives me about 42 more years to live with myself and to bear witness to what my actions did, are doing, and will continue to do to my wife, Lily, and also to see how it will affect our surviving child, Maisie, as she becomes old enough to understand that once upon a time, she had a twin brother who died because of her daddy.
Man, I was so nervous to read that. I, I, haven't, I haven't shown it to anybody yet. Uh, why I chose to read it to an audience, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I really appreciate your listening. I know, I know it was kind of long. And I'm sorry I, I, um, I sort of you know, blew the party down. But <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Well, it sure doesn't take much for me to cry. So, good Lord, Wally, and thank you. Um, Wally is open to a few questions. Um, make them good ones. Let's not waste his time. He's got a book to write. But if anybody has any, but I do. I mean, I do. Because fiction is so... F I think I can do it, but I can't. So, that's your first chapter, to me, it's done. I mean, do you have... I, my question is, do you have the end scheme in mind, or does it come as these characters step in and you begin to create them? I'll open with that, and then we'll take a, a, maybe three questions. I always feel envious when I hear about writers who outline the whole novel uh, before they sit down and do the first chapter. Um, it doesn't work that way for me. What I, I, and, and lots of times when I hear actors talk about their work, that seems more akin to what I do because um, I always write in the first person. One of the things I really enjoy about writing, and I don't enjoy that much about it, uh, is, is that it gives me the opportunity to climb out of my own skin and inhabit somebody else's and then learn uh, then learn things uh, that I hadn't known before. Um, so I don't know where this is going. Um, I have a couple of vague ideas, sort of like, you know, somebody threw something at the bottom of a swimming pool, and I can see it's it's kind of blurry, and uh, and I know there's something down there, but I but I don't I don't know what it's going to be. Um, I uh, so no, I don't I I don't I don't know where it's going. Um, I know he's going to get out of prison. Um, I know when I look at this chapter how much my prison students at York have taught me. Uh, and um, in a lot of ways, I have been their student. Um, but uh, not sure. Not sure. Mm -hmm. Mark Ruffalo, who is uh, playing the uh, identical twin brothers uh, of, the, of an HBO series that's based on my second novel, I know this much is true, um, he's like wicked dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> and what's more important to me is he's a hell of a nice guy. Um, when I first met Mark, um, when we decided to work together on this, he had just read the book and um, he was really excited about doing it because, uh, like Tom, like Dominic Birdsey in that novel, uh, he also had a troubled relationship with a brother, not a twin brother, and so uh, we were going to meet at a at a little lunch place in New York City where he, where he lives, and um, so I was a little bit late. It was snowy. It was a snowy day, and I walked in, and he goes, uh, you know, I was led to his table, and he goes. Oh Wally, hey man, um, uh, you know I'm so I'm so nervous to meet you that I've changed the table three different times, and I'm like, you're nervous to meet me, dude. Lower your expectations. You know? uh, but anyway, very humble, uh, very politically active, and in, in, you know in, the, in a lot of the ways that I am, and um, it's just been a, a, a real pleasure to work with him, and also with the director. Uh, of this series. It's, a, it's going to be six episodes, um, and uh, the director's name is Derek C. in France. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen a little independent movie that he did, uh, something called Blue Valentine, um, with um, Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams, and then another Ryan Gosling film he did called, I think it's called The Place Beyond the Pines. Um, really, he's a really good director, and and 
boy, did he take on a challenge because he adapted the novel into chapters, into episodes. Then he directed, it was a, it was a shoot up in Poughkeepsie, New York um, that lasted for 120 days, uh, just finished about two or three weeks ago. And now he's, you know, sitting down to edit the whole thing. So it may be, it'll probably be out if he, if he has, you know, if, 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 the, if the editing goes well, it may be out on HBO by about April or May of next year to uh, 2020. And, um, and HBO really wants to sort of position it for Emmy nominations. So, so I don't know. Um, but anyway, Mark is a great guy. And uh, yes, he's pretty cute. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did everybody hear the question? What's with this twin thing you have? There always seems to be twins in your novels. And it's true, there are twins in Chinese food. Um, I, I'm fascinated by twins, and I love Chinese food. Um, so, so I put them in all my novels. And um, I think it probably stems from the fact that I was something of a lonely kid when I was growing up. And I always sort of fantasized about having a soulmate who was, you know, who is your twin. Um, I never even had a brother. I had two older sisters. And every, every year on my birthday when I was a kid, I would wish for a brother. And all I got was uh, a, a, a cocker spaniel named Taffy, another girl in the family. Um, but I, but I've, always, I've always been fascinated by twins. Um, there are twins on the cover of I Know This Much Is True, the, uh, you know, the original hardcover. And they are infant twins. And uh, it's a photograph that was taken by, a, I think he's a psych, no, he's a, um, he's a plastic surgeon in Chicago, and, um, and he, that's his avocation. He, he, you know, is sort of obsessive about photographing twins. And, um, and I learned about his, he didn't know why he was so obsessed, but his mother told him shortly before she died that, um, she thought she lost him in utero, that you know she was bleeding pretty badly, and then you know he was he was alive, and she birthed him, and he theorizes that all of this photography is um, his impulse to keep looking for his twin uh, that that had died, you know in you know in in, in utero. Um, I don't know if that's my fascination, but. Um, I do love the idea of that, um, you know, that built-in soulmate. Um, although in the Birdsey's case, <laughs> it's a little challenging <laughs> for Dominic. Good question. Thank you. Um, and uh, Peter, over there. Ten days. Um, one of the things that came up that tonight I didn't realize what you meant uh, when you critted all the work. Uh, in one of the most friendly, just wonderful way, uh, you mentioned that my work wasn't dark enough. Well, your story is not. <laughs> I realized what you meant. <laughs> I'll, I'll, end the, I'll end the questioning with a, a, a brief story about, um, about that trip to Priano, uh, which is on the Amalfi Coast. We were, we were staying in the artist Saul Lewitt's um, uh, home. And uh, you know there were Saul Lewitt paintings on the walls and so forth. It was really quite fantastic. But anyway, um, some of you may know Larry Bloom. And he, was, he and his wife, Suzanne Levine, were the you know, they were the organizers of this little school we had going. And, we, and when we were leaving, um, we, had to, we had to fly back from um, uh, the Naples airport. So Priano to Naples on these skinny little back roads, uh, it's about, I don't know, as I recall, about an hour. We got to Naples, we were early. So it's my wife, Chris, and Larry and Suzanne. And, um, 
because we were early, we decided to get a sandwich or something. So we went up to the second floor of the Naples airport, and um, and uh, Suzanne said to Chris, you want to go look at the shops? And Chris said, um, yeah, okay. Uh, she had spent, the, she wasn't in the class or anything, my wife, but she had spent uh, the, the week, 10 days, photographing the town. And she has a nice camera, so she put it on the floor next to me, and she said, just watch my camera, okay? I said, yeah, okay. So, um, I, so I, went, I, w I went to get a cup of coffee, and, and I see Larry, uh, there's, a, there's like an old bag lady, and she's approaching, and um, she's got her bag open, and you know she's collecting money from people. And so uh, Larry, who knew a little Italian, was speaking to an Italian, and uh, and 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 so I had a you know I had a couple of um, euros that I threw in her bag. Okay, yeah, 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 uh huh, yeah. And uh, she she hobbled away and started down the escalator and out the door. And all of a sudden, I looked down. It's like the camera, you know, it was missing. So I go tear assing down those escalator stairs, and I see her. Walking down, she's outside the uh, the airport at this point, and I said, "Hey, where's my wife's camera?" And she's like, "Oh no 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 yeah yeah I don't know English." And uh, I go, "Never mind that." I said, "I want that camera." So she's opening up her bag, no camera. I'm thinking, well, she she fenced it with somebody or hid it or something. So I said, "Come on," I said. We're going back. I'm going to call the police. Oh, no, 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 police, whatever that word is. And um, I go, come on, come on, come on. And um, I'm usually pretty brave with bag ladies, you know? <laughs> so um, so I, I get her back into the, into, the, uh, into the airport, and I see Larry up there. He's completely oblivious. He doesn't know what's going on. So I bring the bag lady up so that he can talk to her in Italian. And I said, she took my wife's camera. And, um, and so he says, uh, you know, they're, they're talking. And, um, and uh, I, say, uh, I say, I know it's her because, you know, she was sitting right here and now the camera's not there. So uh, she kept denying it. And um, finally he said, uh, uh, no, I said, you don't know, you know, think my wife took the camera with her, did she? And he said, I don't know. I have my cell phone. I'll call Suzanne to see. And he, so he's like, darling, does Chris have her camera? And he looks up at me and he goes. Oh. So I'm like, now I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. And let me get you something. And, you know, uh, and now I'm taking out like big bills, big euros, throwing them in her bag. And I said, can I get you a sandwich or a cup of coffee? And she goes, eh, eh. So, so I bring her over to the counter and I said to the clerk, I said, please give this lady, a, this nice lady, a sandwich. She goes, no, 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 no. And I said, or a cup of coffee? And she goes, cappuccino. <laughs> so I did not uh, cause a, uh, an international incident, but I could have, yeah. Thank you, everybody.